Um, first, I wanna say, I wanna say thank you so much for all of you for being here, and thank you so much for Marina, uh, to Marina for 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 accepting our invitation to speak. We're very excited about her talk. Her talk is on Bayesian variable selection. Um, and before I introduce her, I also want to thank Statistics Without Borders, Alexand Alexandra for Alexandra Schmidt and, and um, Donna for all their support for this webinar. Um, so let me say a little bit about the speaker. Dr. Banucci is Noah Harding Professor of Statistics. She's also an adjunct faculty member at the UT MD Anderson Cancer Center in Texas. Dr. Banucci is generally interested in the development of Bayesian statistical models for complex problems and in applications to science. She has contributed to methodological research on Bayesian variable selection techniques for linear settings, mixture models, and graphical models, and to related computational algorithms. Her research is often motivated by real problems that need to be addressed with suitable statistical methods. She has a solid history of scientific collaborations and is particularly interested in applications of Bayesian inference to high thoroughput genomics and to neuroscience and neuroimaging. Dr. Banucci was the recipient of an NSF Career Award in 2001. She's an elected member of the International Statistical Institute and an elected fellow of the American Statistical Association, the Institute of Mathematical Statistics, the American Association of the Advancements of Sciences, and the International Society for Bayesian Analysis. She holds a BS in Mathematics and a PhD in Statistics, both from the University of Florence, Italy. Um, so I'm so I'm very pleased to welcome Marina. And, and, and um, so now Marina will, will, will start her presentation and we will interrupt with questions um, every once in a while. So uh, please feel free to put your questions in, in the Q&A and when the time comes, we will try to answer all the questions. Um, Marina, it's, the floor is all yours. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Carolina and Alex for the invitation. And thanks for the very nice introduction. I'm very excited about giving this uh, uh, webinar. It uh, gave me the chance to assemble some material. And um, also a couple of years ago, I co-edited a book on Bayesian variable selection. So this is also for me a good chance to you know, uh, show you a little bit about what is in uh, in that book. Um, so because I was not sure about the, the, the background of the, the audience here, I have prepared like a three slides um, introduction to what's the, the Bayesian thinking. Uh, so, so, so the thinking behind the Bayesian approach and uh, just a one slide review on the on the linear regression model. And then after that, um, we will jump directly into the, the topic of uh, variable selection. We will stay most of the time within the framework of the classical linear regression model. And uh, I will um, talk about mainly the Bayesian priors for variable selection, but also comparing and contrasting them with some of the classical approaches. And uh, I'll give you some references for extensions beyond the, the, the Gaussian model, but still in the linear settings. And as I said, I have uh, published this book, Handbook on Bayesian Variable Selection, so I'll tell you a little bit about what is in that, that book. And then I'll try to show you um, Bayesian Variable Selection in practice by talking through a couple of applications. I hope to be able to cover both of them. One is in neuroimaging and one is in genomics, in particular the analysis of uh, microbiome uh, data. So I'll show you Bayesian approaches for this data that uh, uh, use uh, this class of priors for uh, variable selection that I'm going to introduce. I don't think I will have time to talk about uh, the parallel development of edge selection in graphical uh, models. Uh, but I've left the, the slides in the presentation. I thought it would be nice, at least for people, to have the, uh, the references once the slides get um, um, uh, become available. OK, so, so what is the Bayesian uh, thinking? Um, in, in statistics, um, statisticians use probability to represent uncertainty, uh, and that's a fact. In Bayesian statistics, a statistician thinks about uh, uh, probability as a way to describe uncertainty about uh, all that is unknown. So in other words, all unknown quantities are random and they have, there's uncertainty about them and therefore there is a probability distribution that allows me to describe that uncertainty. 
So once we look at the problem and the unknown quantities in, in the problem, there will be some beliefs or prior um, that, we, that we have about the unknowns. And so these beliefs or prior information can be expressed by a, a distribution that we call a prior distribution. And then we use the base rule of the base theorem as a tool to update our knowledge, our belief about the unknowns via um, the, the, the base rule through the information that comes from, from the data. So in other words, the base theorem, theorem is our way of updating the knowledge about the unknowns with the evidence that comes from, uh, from the observed uh, data. Um, Therefore, there are these, you know, these three pillars of the approach, the prior distribution, the likelihood, and the posterior distribution. The prior distribution expresses our beliefs or knowledge about the unknowns before we see the data. The posterior distribution is the updated knowledge after we have seen the data. And the, 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 the base theorem is the tool that we use to make that, uh, that update. The underlying hypothesis, though, is that you know all unknown quantities are random. They are, can be represented by random variables and, and probability distributions that allow us to describe, characterize the uncertainty about those unknowns. So when I when I uh, teach Bayesian statistics to, to students at Rice, I like to present the approach as kind of the three steps uh, approach. So there's a there's a step one which is actually common to to uh, you know, to all statisticians, whether you're a frequentist or, or a Bayesian, which is the choice of your uh, probability model. So you, you know, you make some assumptions on the generating mechanism, uh, the, the, the mechanism that has generated the, the data. And so this will set for you, set up for you <clears throat> a distribution and some unknowns. These unknowns could be parameters of the distribution, but they could also be missing data or, or latent variables. So now you have your uh, choice of model and you have your, your theta there synthesizing your um, set of unknowns. The second step, which is proper to the to, um, specific to the Bayesian approach is to set a, a, a prior distribution. So the prior distribution reflects our uncertainty, our knowledge or our ignorance about the unknowns before we actually see the data. And again, we can be, yeah. yes. Sorry, it's Alex. Some people are saying that these slides, and it's true, these slides are not changing. They, have you changed these slides? Yes. Okay, let me do this. Because when sorry, I... Sorry to interrupt you. Yeah, no, no, it's good. Because when I started sharing, I actually chose... I usually don't do that. So I usually use desktop, but I made a different choice. Okay, perfect. So now they are... Yeah, now I can see. It. Uh, can you go page? Uh, can you change? Um, I see the front page. Yes. Okay, just a second. Okay. Okay, yeah. it's changing now. Perfect. Okay, thank you. Okay, okay, okay. So this was the outline of the talk. I'm just pausing for you to look at it briefly. And then when I was, you know, talking about the Bayesian thinking, this is sort of maybe just the plot says everything, right? In terms of uh, using a prior distribution to quantify uncertainty or, or belief before seeing the data and then the, the, the base rule as a way to update the prior into the posterior via the evidence provided uh, through the to the likelihood through the data and now we were talking about the three steps of the of the approach where the step number one is to choose a, a probability uh, model and therefore setting uh, setting up the the, the the vector theta which uh, characterizes the unknown quantities of the model. There can be parameters, missing data, or latent variables. And then step two, which is the step specific to the Bayesian approach, is to choose a prior distribution that reflects uncertainty about the, uh, the unknowns. And this um, can be knowledge about the unknowns, but it also can be ignorance, right? So a prior uh, ignorance, a prior can express uh, ignorance about the, the parameter itself. And then the third step is the application of, of the Bayes theorem, where given the, the data, we, we update our knowledge. So we calculate the distribution of theta conditioning upon the data, conditioning among the evidence that, that we have acquired. And the Bayes theorem is the tool that allows us to do this update. So we calculate the posterior distribution, which is you know this expression here is typically proportional to the likelihood times, uh, times a prior. And therefore, the posterior will sort of like you know, strike a, a compromise or a balance between 
the information that we inject through our prior beliefs and the uh, evidence that, that comes from, uh, from the data. Um, so, so the base theorem results in an entire distribution, the posterior distribution, uh, but you know, posterior distribution can be summarized in a number of different ways. For example, we can um, derive uh, point estimates, uh, for example, using the mean. So the mean of the posterior distribution could be our base uh, estimate of, of the parameter. And then we can characterize uncertainty around that estimate via what we call a, a credible interval, which is simply calculated based on the percentiles of the, of the distribution, the posterior distributions. And then we can do hypothesis testing, again, based on the posterior distribution. We might have, if we are testing an hypothesis, we might have an M1 and an M2, and we can look at the, at the evidence, right? We call it the base factor as the, the ratio of the evidence versus the, um, the evidence towards the, the, the two different models. Um, and if you um, just want to read one um, uh, sort of paper on Bayesian statistics, which is kind of like a broad, inter broad overview of the approach, and it's, it's a paper that you know, aims at people who not, do not necessarily have a strong background in, uh, in statistics, there is this uh, paper appeared as uh, article number one of volume one of Nature Reviews Methods uh, Primers, where I, I contributed together with many other um, authors and uh, it covers Bayesian statistics and, and modeling. Uh, also talking a little bit about the you, you know the, the critiques and the different uh, um, discussions uh, around the, the approach. From it also covers practical aspects of the approach approach like those that I'm going to describe next. So what are the practical aspects of the implementation right of a of a Bayesian analysis? <clears throat> First of all the approach requires the specification of, uh, of the prior, right? And I already said that uh, <clears throat> this prior, this, this knowledge of belief can, can also be ignorance about the, um, the, the parameter itself. So we can use what we call objective priors, but it can also be subjective. So it can express you know, real knowledge, real belief that you might have about the parameters. <clears throat> um, another important uh, practical aspect of the application of the of the approach is the ability if we look back at the uh, theorem is, is the ability essentially to calculate the integrals like you know, to calculate this this integral here and this for a long time was a big hurdle for uh, for Bayesian statisticians up until um, the late 80s and early, early 90s when um, Alan Gelfand and Adrian uh, Smith um, came up with uh, you know ways that essentially we we, we could use um, MCMC Monte Carlo Markov chain algorithms borrowed from from physics to essentially derive uh, a posterior a sample from the posterior distribution. So we, so now we no longer need to calculate those integrals, but because we are able to get a posterior from the distribution, uh, a sample from the posterior distribution itself. And then with that sample, we can calculate empirical quantities like empirical means, empirical percentiles, and so on. Um, the third uh, practical aspect is uh, what we call sensitivity analysis. This is very important. Uh, it's very important for a Bayesian to, to you know, be aware of the sensitivity of your prior uh, specification. So how does um, changing your prior would affect the uh, the inference, right? The, the, the posterior distribution. This is something very important that always needs to be done in a, in a Bayesian analysis. Okay, so this was my, you know, three three slides introduction on, uh, on Bayesian statistics. And I want to conclude by saying that uh, although the, the approaches uh, seem quite different, right? I mean, philosophically, they, they are very different, right? In, in Bayesian statistics, we we think of the unknowns as, as random quantities, and, and we, we quantify uncertainty via a prior distribution, which is updated um, uh, in light of the observed data. In the classical framework, the parameters are, yes, unknown, but fixed. They're not random, right? And the uncertainty quantification is done by resorting to this mechanism of repeated sampling, right? So, which is you know very very different from what we do in Bayesian statistics. So, although like you know the premises and and the philosophical approach um, approaches are, are different, in practical terms, the, the two approaches often result to um, comparable uh, inferences, and this is true in particular 
when Bayesians use uh, objective uh, uh, priors. So, so the two approach don't go too, too far away from, from each other in terms of what you can get out of, of an analysis. And, and actually nowadays, the Bayesian and frequentist debate which was you know, very hard in the past is now really a thing of the, of the past. And most data analysts would take the pragmatic point of view of using whatever approach is the most useful, the most helpful for, uh, for the problem at hand. Okay, um, so, so now that you know, we, we know this, let's move on to a, 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 you know, a practical uh, uh, model. And this um, model is the linear regression setting. And in, in this setting, the setting of the linear regression model, I will also introduce the idea of variable selection and uh, eventually the priors that we use for, for variable selection. So, so, so in, the, in the linear regression uh, setting, the, uh, the, this is the typical model. So typically we will observe a response variable and uh, a set of, uh, of uh, predictors, uh, P, and we want to see whether the, the outcome, outcome can be expressed, at least on average, as a linear combination of the predictors. We, uh, on the observations, we allow some noise, and then we have some assumptions on, on the noise, in particular here that it is Gaussian, and there is a variance uh, sigma squared, which is constant with respect to the predictors. When we look at this uh, at this model, the unknown quantities are what the the regression coefficients, the vector of the regression coefficients, and this will be the important parameters once we do variable selection. Right? And and also we have sigma squared, the variance of the noise, as an unknown uh, parameter. So so if you look at uh, in 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 the classical framework, we would take uh, we would calculate an estimate of the parameters as the least squares uh, estimate, which we obtain by um, minimizing the uh, residual sum of squares. In Bayesian statistics, we can think about uh, priors that uh, express what, what we call uh, uh, ignorance, uh, so what we call uh, non-informative priors on the coefficients, the regression coefficient and sigma squared. For example, you have here the Jeffries prior, and the Jeffries prior will lead to the, distribu the posterior distribution of beta, actually the marginal posterior distribution of beta being a T distribution centered in the least squares estimate of beta. Yeah. So you can see how your posterior distribution is centered in the frequentist estimate, right? So, so that's, that's the kind of, uh, you know, balance and, and, and uh, uh, overlap that I was uh, talking about uh, uh, before. Okay. Even when you um, walk away from a prior like the Jeffries prior and you use, for example, a conjugate prior like the normal inverse gamma that, that I have uh, written up uh, here, then the, the posterior distribution of, uh, uh, of beta will be still centered in a weighted, in, in a mean which is a weighted average of, uh, of, of the uh, classical uh, estimate and the prior mean. Okay, So there's always that, uh, that compromise uh, going on. Okay, um, and I will go back to using these uh, conjugate priors uh, once I introduce the, um, uh, the framework of, uh, of variable selection. All right, so now moving on to the, um, the, the, the variable selection, the problem of variable selection in this um, linear, in the linear setting that, that we just saw. So, so first of all, why do, do we want to do variable selection? When you have large P, so when you have a large number of uh, covariates, it makes sense not to use all of them because you may just want to use the variables that really uh, help in, in predicting the response, right? Because otherwise you might just including more noise into the into the model, leading to overfitting the, the uh, leading to overfitting. Also more important, there are lots of situations where indeed the selection is the goal of the analysis. This is true uh, in many different applications. Uh, later on, we will see an example from neuroimaging, but also genomics is a pretty good example. There are lots of situations where people observe measurement, takes measurements on genes, proteins, microbiomes, and so on. And the purpose of the goal is to be able to identify the genes or the proteins or the, or the microbes that have, you know, that help predict uh, a, phen a phenotype or you know, a, a disease-related type of, of outcome. Okay? So selection is often the goal, one, one of the goals of the, of the analysis. But then what happens once you, you know, start 
looking at the regression model that has lots and lots of predictors is that uh, because they, if you look, for example, the, the, the least squares estimates, right, they, um, they depend on uh, um, x transpose x to minus one, right? So if you have lots of covariates and if, uh, you know, it will be likely that uh, many of these covariates are uh, um, dependent on each other. So, so you are in a situation of multicollinearity. And then this x transpose x can become singular or nearly singular, and the inversion is going to be problematic. Right? Um, so you do want, right, you do want to do something. Right? You do want to do some, whether it is variable selection or shrinkage of the coefficients, and we will see later. But you want, you need to do uh, to address that issue. Um, if we look at the approaches for variable selection, I kind of distinguish them in like the three different buckets, right? There were some approaches that were popular in, in the past, um, which is, you know, computing things like uh, the CP, the Mannon CP, AIC, BIC, adjusted R squared. They kind of look for a, like a, a best selection, sub -sub, best subset selection by a, a stepwise selection method. So you would try to somehow order uh, or, or go through an ordered set of uh, um, subsets, uh, possible subsets of of, um, of the covariates, and try to find the, the the best based on some some criteria. This works well only when n is greater than p, because otherwise you can not calculate some of those. And also, um, it only selects a, a single best model and and, and ignores completely the, the model uncertainty, right? The uncertainty about that selection, because the, there may be many other models that are you know, equally equally good. Um, so, so these methods have sort of like, you know, they're still used, but I believe they've been sort of you know, abandoned a little bit in favor of most uh, more uh, modern uh, uh, techniques, like for example, the penalization methods, things like rich regression, but also the famous lasso by, uh, by Tip Sharani, where the idea is, okay, I do have this lots of variables in my model. What I'm going to do to, you know, to, to create stability essentially is to shrink down, so try to shrink the coefficients down towards zero. And I'm going to do this shrinkage by in the frequency setting, in the lasso setting by imposing a penalty, a penalty on the on the likelihood, a penalty on, 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 on the size of the coefficients. In, in, uh, and these approaches have been very, very uh, successful um, um, in applications. Uh, then there is the Bayesian approach. In the Bayesian approach, we can try to um, use priors to, to recreate this uh, effect, this shrinkage effect that I just, uh, that I just uh, described, right? So you, we can envision priors, and I'm gonna show you a couple of them that effectively shrink the coefficients uh, towards zero a posteriori. Okay? But we can also uh, use uh, or design priors that achieve selection of the coefficients. And you will see what I mean in a second. Okay? So how about shrinkage? Um, we can, um, for example, uh, I didn't talk about uh, reach too much, but we can, for example, choose priors on the coefficients, which are essentially independent Gaussians, like those that you see in, 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 in the slide. Okay? And this will result a, effectively in a rich uh, estimate. So the posterior mode in particular will be the rich uh, estimate. And the constant uh, G is the, will act like the, the penalty uh, parameter. Or we can think about the prior distribution on beta J as the double, expo double exponential or the Laplace prior where uh, you, you sort of substitute right, the, the, the Gaussian distribution with the distribution. I actually have a plot in the next slide with a distribution like the, the, the red one, okay, which is more picked, and that results in effectively assigning um, more, uh, more mass, more weight in the, in the regions which are, which are close to zero. So that in, in the posterior, you will be favored in settings with most of the um, beta j is being small, being close to zero, and a few of the beta j is being uh, being large. Okay. So effectively, with a prior, we can induce this um, um, this action of of shrinking the estimates uh, towards zero. The uh, and, and this um, so this is the this is called the Bayesian lasso prior. There are many more of these that we call shrinkage priors. The most famous one is the horseshoe prior. 
and uh, I don't have all the references here because this is all uh, I'm about to say about the shrinkage priors, but I put this reference here to a review paper, which is really nice paper that reviews all shrinkage prior for Bayesian penalized uh, regression. I'm not gonna spend more time on the shrinkage prior. And the reason is that although very effective, very computationally extremely effective, shrinkage priors do not result in exact zeros. So at the end of the day, your covariates are all included, your betas are all different than zero. So you don't achieve a selection unless you threshold the posterior of beta somehow, right? So that you might say that, you know, the smallest betas are effectively zeros and therefore you are selecting out those, uh, those uh, covariates, okay? Instead, if we want to achieve selection of the uh, coefficients, and, and um, again, as I said, there are situations where selection is the goal of the analysis, a class of prior that is more suitable for uh, uh, for this action is the class of uh, so-called spiking slab priors. <clears throat> so now um, I'm going to introduce um, this class of priors. Um, so if we think back of the the regression model and how we want to achieve selection, right? So we said a covariate is not going to include, is not going to be included in the model if the corresponding regression coefficient is zero because in doing X times beta, I'm, I'm multiplying by zero. So that covariate is not in, in, in the model, in the likelihood at all, right? So it's important to be able to assign mass, right? To the event that beta is zero, which we cannot do with a continuous distribution. So the spike and slab gets around this problem by essentially designing a prior on beta j, which is a mixture of two distributions. One distribution is the Gaussian distribution, which you know in this form it happens happens to be conjugate uh, to the into the in the linear regression. Um, it could also be a, a different distribution, even a Laplace distribution. And then the second component of the mixture is a, a, a spike at zero. So it's a distribution, it's a Dirac uh, function, Dirac distribution, Dirac function distribution. It's a distribution that uh, poses all the mass at, um, at zero. It's one for, for beta equal zero, right? And zero uh, otherwise. So, so uh, now we have a prior on beta j which is a spike and slab, right? So it's a mixture of a spike at zero. So you give mass to the event that beta j is equal to zero and therefore the corresponding covariate is not important. And a Gaussian distribution that describes the uncertainty for the important covariates. It, this mm, mixture is um, indexed by a, <clears throat> an indicator, this gamma j, right? So gamma j, equal one means that the variable is important, is included in the model, therefore the corresponding prior on beta j is the Gaussian. Gamma j equals zero means that the variable is not important, should not be included in the model, the corresponding, the prior on the corresponding beta j is the spike at zero. <clears throat> and you can see that um, if you look at this uh, sort of latent vector gamma, which is the vector that um, considers all the indicators, gamma one, gamma p, Right? Then you can see that different values of gammas will be different combinations of zeros and ones that will correspond to different subsets of X. So with this mechanism, I'm able to index right, the different subsets of the, of the covariates uh, with using these indicators. Of course, in doing this, I've also introduced an extra set of parameters in the model, right? because now the gamma j's that I have introduced are unknown them, themselves. And actually they are the important parameters because at the end of the day, the goal, if the goal is to do um, se variable selection, then the, the gamma is gonna be the parameter of interest. The posterior distribution of gamma is gonna tell me which variables are important, which variables are not, which variables should be selected, which variables should be not selected. So we have to, um, um, select the prior for this uh, gamma vector. And um, the prior that you have here on this slide is the, is the, the simplest one that one can think of. 
because it's a set of indicators, zero, one, the Bernoulli distribution is the typical um, distribution that, that we use to capture uncertainty on binary uh, random variables. So we can think about a product of independent uh, random uh, Bernoulli distributions this par with parameters, uh, what is this, W, WJ. We can even think of Bernoulli distributions with the same W, like a constant W for all uh, covariance. This is sort of the simplest possible prior. It makes some assumptions uh, <clears throat> because you are assuming that uh, uh, the inclusion or exclusion of one variable is independent of the other variables, right? And, and we will see that there are applications where this is not true, but I will also show you how actually one of the strengths of this construction is that we can incorporate a whole lot of information about uh, um, structure among the covariates simply by modifying this, uh, this prior here. But this is the, you know, in the form that you see on the slide, this is the original uh, development of spike slab priors as it was proposed by uh, George McCulloch uh, in the early 90s <coughs> and um, with the independent uh, uh, Bernoulli's. In this framework with this conjugate uh, prior, for posterior inference, what we can do, I already said that you know the, the parameter of interest is gamma, so we can use the conjugate structure to marginalize over the, the, the other model parameters, right? So we can integrate out beta, sigma, <clears throat> and, the, and in the intercept alpha, and essentially calculate this posterior distribution. We're, we're not gonna be able to calculate the normalizing constant, so we will know only we will only be able to calculate relative posterior probabilities. And in situations where p the number of covariates is small, we could even think about fully enumerating all the two to the p possible subsets of the covariates, and therefore fully calculate this posterior distribution. But for all practical purposes, in applications, we'll, we'll always have a large p that will make this enumeration <clears throat> not possible. And so in Bayesian statistics, we have resorted to uh, stochastic searches as a way to explore the posterior distribution of, of uh, gamma, looking for the, the good models, looking for the gamma vectors with high values of the posterior probability. Okay. This is different from a typical MCMC because we are not interested in a sample from this distribution. We are only interested in finding the values of gammas that have high posterior. Right? So in that sense, it's a stochastic search and not an MCMC. And there are several of these stochastic searches here. You have a metropolis, which is the one that I always use because it's very easy and, and very efficient. And so essentially, you will be moving in the space <clears throat> of all the possible subsets of the models by uh, changing uh, one or two variables at a time, and then comparing <clears throat> the two models, the new one <clears throat> with the old one, based on an acceptance probability, which depends on what we call an exact ratio. It's a ratio of two relative posterior probabilities. It's exact because the constant of proportionality is the same above and below, and therefore it cancels out. And so this makes the stochastic search very effective because if gamma nu as a higher posterior probability than gamma old, it will get accepted. Okay? So uh, the search moves very fast towards better and better models. And then the idea is to run these stochastic searches for a long time and then collect the output, right? And the output will be what? Will be a list of what we call visited models, right? So, so there will be a, a model uh, that, I, that I started with, for example, I might choose to start from a model that has all the variables included, right? And then it will be the second visit, the third visit, the fourth visit, and so on. And these models will be different from one or two variables according to the moves that I have made. And what I, what I can do, I can look at the um, all the models that I have visited at least once, and I can order them according to their posterior probabilities. Okay, so now this notation here with these parentheses are the ordered that's the ordered vis the ordered list of visited models. So gamma zero will be the model among those visited that has the highest posterior probability. 
so then this ordering will give me what well, it gives me a best model but it also gives me a second best a third best a fourth best and so on right? and, and and so this will allow me to uh, do inference or uh, you know do uncertainty quantification based on the marginal on the joint distribution of the uh, of the gamma i can also do things like calculating uh, uh, posterior probabilities for individual covariates simply by looking at the at the marginal distributions so i can calculate marginal posterior probabilities for the individual covariates which are very simply calculated as empirical frequencies I'm, uh, I'm going to be looking at this at the visited models, okay? and then for each variable, say variable one, I'm going to count the number of models that included variable one, and, and that will be my frequency, my, my estimate of the of the PPI for variable one, and then I'll do the same for variable two, and so on. And in the plot that you that we have here, we see uh, these marginal posterior probabilities on inclusion. And so the idea would be that you know the, the highest. The more important the variable is, right? If it is one, it's basically included in every visited model. And what, what we more typically do is to threshold this plot. For example, 0.5 will give you what we call the medium model. So all variables with PPI greater than 0.5 will be included in at least 50% of the visited models. That's the medium model. And they will give you a selection uh, based on uh, uh, marginal posterior. Okay? So it's a very rich output. It's, you know, it's a, very, a, a lot of different ways that you can um, um, characterize uncertainty around, around your selection. And then a nice, uh, another nice feature of this approach is that with this output and with this knowledge from, from my stochastic search, we can look at the prediction aspect, uh, which is very important, right, in a, in a um, regression model, and we can do what we call uh, model averaging, Bayesian model averaging. So that's, a, you know, uh, I think Spike and Sarah Prios are very well known for this um, uh, aspect of the, of the inference. The idea is very simple. Um, if, I look at the, if I look at the future um, um, outcome uh, corresponding to, you know, an, an observed future X, uh, the way the Bayesians do predict predictions is via the predictive distribution, in particular calculating the um, the, the prediction, the base predi predictive uh, prediction as the, the mean of the predictive distribution. So here, because I have a number of good models, num a number of best models, maybe equally good models, it makes sense to do the prediction by averaging right, the predictions across a number of best models, not just one. Right? And, and so this is the formula for, for how, how, how we do that. So the Bayesian model, model averaging estimate is, a, the, is the posterior <clears throat> is the posterior weighted average of model predictions over a number of uh, best uh, models, each uh, weighted by the, uh, their, their posterior probability. <clears throat> we can also look at, at single best models uh, like the marginal model or the individual uh, best models and do individual predictions with those models. But typically, you know, Bayesian model averaging is a very robust way of doing a uh, uh, prediction in, in this uh, set. Okay, so I'll skip this. So let me read the advantages and then I'll stop for um, some questions. Okay, so, so this is in a nutshell, right, is the approach to variable selection with Spike and Slab prior. As you can see, it's a Bayesian approach, so it allows to incorporate uh, prior knowledge, and and this will be very evident once I get to talk about the the applications. Uh, again, it's a Bayesian approach, so it provides uncertainty quantification through the posterior distribution. It works well for all situations, all settings, n bigger than p, but also n smaller than than p. We can handle large p situations with this rich class of uh, stochastic searches slash MCMC methods. We can do optimal uh, uh, prediction via model averaging, and it extends pretty nicely to the multivariate response setting, which is the case of multiple responses, which was actually my work as a postdoctoral fellow, which I'm, I'm going to mention um, uh, in a second. But now I think I can stop and maybe breathe for a few seconds, <laughs> so I'll take a few questions. <laughs> Thank you, Marina. This is going really well. As I said, I'm, I'm really excited. Uh, we have five questions in the Q&A. 
I think uh, I will start with uh, the one from Afranio Vieira who asks, there is a way to, after a lasso model, work on the variable selection over the posterior samples. Actually, if you prefer to read the questions yourself, you, you just click on the Q&A, you will see all the questions, Marina. Okay. Uh, introduction on posterior. Oh, okay. I started from the last. Are you looking? At I, the... I started from the second one. From the... Oh, from the second. Okay. Uh, but... There is a way to, after a last model, work on the variable selection of the posterior samples. Yeah, I mean, the way is to threshold the posterior of the beta, right? But so you have to threshold the posterior of beta in, in kind of um, a way. That might not be optimal, right? Because you are thresholding the posterior of the beta. So unlike the spike and slab that gives you the PPI, right? The spike and slab gives you the ability to estimate the the pro the posterior distribution for for that beta to be different than zero, or that variable to be included, or the gamma j to be equal to one, which are all equivalent uh, things, right? So you don't have that ability with a, a shrinkage prior. But but yes, the answer is yes. The selection can be done by by a second step, right? By adding a step where you threshold in, you do threshold in on the posterior distribution of the betas directly. How large should oh, how large should the should be p as the numeration method? Yeah, uh, when I was doing these things with MATLAB coding, uh, <clears throat> I think uh, 20, 25 as a p was the largest that I could afford a full enumeration, right? Because you think that two to the P grows fast, grows large very, very fast. So I think 2025 is probably still at the, the upper bound. What is the difference between marginal posterior probability and model posterior? Uh, yes, so, so the marginal posterior probability is this thing that I call PPI, right? And it's the probability of the gamma J being equal to one. The model posterior probability I'm referring to as the, the probability of an individual model, of an individual value of the gamma vector. So you can say gamma, a model with variables one, two, and three, you can calculate the posterior distribution of this model, the model that includes the variable one, one, two, and three, okay? Versus the marginal posterior distribution where you are calculating the probability of variable one to be important or variable two to be important. This is marginal. Can you, how can you get prediction, prediction intervals with BMA? I think there is a way because uh, again, you have a post, you have a predictive distribution when you do Bayesian model averaging. Um, so, there, so, so yeah, there should be a way to get predictive intervals as well. Does it work similarly? Well, we, a yeah, categorical ordinal, Interval and reasons case. I will. I think I will get to this question about non-continuous uh, variables. I'm assuming you mean non-continuous on the response, right? What happens if my response is binary or count data? I will get to that. In terms of covariance, yes, you can handle continuous and categorical covariance. Yeah. I would like to know how more about inference on high dimensional. Uh, there are alternatives in cases where I'm seems yes, I will be talking about this. Perhaps we'll see some with the applications. And then there is variational inference, that which I will be mentioning at some point, which is a very good alternative to having to do the full MCMC or the full stochastic search. And there are a couple of papers on variational inference schemes specific for spike and slab priors. Um, I left... Then there is the, the left question is the first one actually that came in about yeah. base factor. Yeah, so base factors, I'm not going to touch upon base factors, but when I, I'm going to show you the book now, there is a, a chapter, actually a few chapters on base factors. Base factors is slightly different because it does not use the spike. I mean, it uses the indicator idea because you can in index all the possible models and then calculate base factors pairwise of all the possible models. So you are kind of limited, I believe, by a full enumeration of the models. And so it's it's different than, than, than what I'm doing, yeah. Okay, did I answer all of them? Yeah, you did answer all of them, Marina. Thank you so much. Okay, perfect. Okay, so in terms of, um, yeah, so in terms of references, 
these are some of the major references that um, uh, they, you know very important kind of the seminal papers right i already mentioned george mccullock uh, this 1993 paper in particular this 1997 paper in statistica sinica it's really a nice uh, a nice read um the idea of uh, you know possibly using a mixture prior with a mass at zero for variable selection was put forward in an earlier paper, just a paper by Mitchell and Duchamp, but they did not uh, um, uh, work on the, they, they did not fully work out the, the, the approach, right? So all this has been done by George and McCulloch uh, in, in their uh, 1993 and 1997 papers. And then I put down a paper on Bayesian model averaging by Raftery. And then this is my paper from my postdoctoral work, extending these prior settings to uh, multivariate uh, regression. So the case where you have multiple responses and multiple covariates. And in this framework, I also like to cite the work by Sylvia Richardson and Leonardo Bottolo. Uh, they have extended these models for multivariate um, regressions using very fancy evolutionary stochastic searches. And they uh, have a good software, an RCCP, implementations uh, that can handle very large um, data sets. They have done applications for with high throughput uh, uh, genetic data, for example, which are typically very, very large. And I didn't talk about, I skipped one slide, so I didn't talk about this reference. Okay, so, so now, so, so these are the kind of, you know, the seminal papers for the approach in the standard linear regression model with uh, with Gaussian uh, data. How about non-Gaussian model? And here, so uh, I mean, already said that I mean non-Gaussian responses. Right? What happens if you having a you have a linear regression model, but your response is not Gaussian? It's for example a binary, right? So you're looking at logistic regression or a model for for count uh, for count responses. There was some earlier work done trying to formalize this class of priors to the general GLM framework, but those approaches did not go very far. It's just very difficult to generalize Bayesian approaches to the general, general framework. Instead, there have been some approaches that have been way more successful for specific uh, models, in particular, uh, probit models for, for binary multinomial responses, as well as um, logit uh, regression models with uh, the use polygamma data augmentation. So the idea here is to essentially insert this spike and slab construction within you know, the, the, the Bayesian data augmentation framework for this type of models, probit or, or logit uh, links, and things work out pretty, uh, pretty nicely. For count data, there are, again, some developments for negative binomial, again, using polygamma data augmentation. And then lately, I've been doing some work with Dirichlet multinomial regressions. This is one of the applications that I have in mind uh, to show you later, hopefully, if we, if we get to, uh, to that. So I'll show you how we can uh, do use spike and slab priors within a Dirichlet multinomial regression model with uh, for count data. And then um, if you really want to know a lot, want to know everything that has been done in Bayesian variable selection over the past uh, 30 years, there is this book, which is, it's a handbook, uh, it's a collection of, of chapters, so it's a handbook of Bayesian variable selection, which I co-edited with Mahalik Tadesse um, two or three years ago, which is a comprehensive review of of all theoretical, methodological, and computational aspects of Bayesian variable selection. The book is divided into four uh, parts. Uh, there are the first part with a few chapters on the, the, the spike and slab prior, the framework that I just uh, introduced. And I'm gonna say um, um, a little bit more, more about, uh, about these uh, four chapters. Then there are a few chapters on the shrinkage priors that I have just briefly introduced, right? The Bayesian lasso, the, uh, the horseshoe prior. So a few chapters on, on shrinkage priors. And there are a few chapters on extensions of uh, variable selection methods to different modeling settings like causal inference, state space models, edge selection and graphical models, and then other approaches to Bayesian variable selection. So different from 
the use of these spike and star priors um, that, that I'm discussing today, including base factors, which was one of the, of the questions, decision three, and partition models for, uh, for clustering. The, the chapters are written by you know, experts in the field, I mean, people who have contributed right to, <clears throat> to the methodology and, and, and the theoretical development of, uh, of, this, uh, of these methods. Um, okay, and so in, in particular, I wanna say a little bit more about Spike and Slap priors and um, sort of the, the four chapters of, of this uh, book, because when you um, go and read um, the book or the literature on, uh, Spike and Slap Prior, even if you read, I guess, the paper, the paper by George McCulloch in 1997, in this paper, there was some, there is some distinction between uh, what we nowadays call discrete Spike and Slab and continuous Spike and Slab. And let me just show you, I think a picture is worth a, a thousand words here, okay? So the, the Spike and Slab that I have described so far is nowadays known as the discrete spike and slab, right? Because it's a mixture distribution where one component of the mixture is a spike at zero, it's a Dirac function, right? It poses all the mass at zero. But if you read the literature uh, on spike and slab priors, many of the earlier papers would uh, try to use what we nowadays call a continuous spike and slab, which is a mixture of two Gaussian distributions, but where Instead of having a spike and a Gaussian, we have two Gaussians, but with very different um, um, variance, variance parameters. Right? In particular, we will have a small Gaussian, which is highly concentrated around zero, and a, a, a more diffuse uh, Gaussian with a larger, uh, larger variance. So the spike is substituted by a Gaussian distribution very, very narrowly concentrated uh, around uh, zero, okay? The, the, the reason for, for doing this was that initially, uh, we thought that uh, this construction, the spike and slab uh, prior was, the discrete spike and slab prior was not extendable to cases beyond uh, conjugate priors and uh, Gaussian, uh, Gaussian settings. Right? because of uh, um, difficulties in calculating the posterior distribution. If you read the, um, the, the George McCulloch paper, for example, they say that uh, if, you abandon non if you abandon conjugate prior, so you abandon Gaussian settings, then the spike and slab uh, prior is hard to um, implement because you can no longer marginalize the regression coefficients out, and therefore you need to do a reversible jump. A reversible jump is something that we do in Bayesian statistics when the dimensionality of the problem, uh, of the model changes iteration by iteration. And it seemed initially that if you leave the regression coefficients out, when the regression coefficient is zero, it's not in the model, right? And so the dimension of beta would change according to the number of covariates that were included. And so it seemed, a, a, a reversible jump situation. And typically, um, reversible jumps suffer from issues of mixing, convergence, and so on. Okay? However, a few years later, in 2008, Gotardo and Raftery showed that it's indeed possible to reformulate the reversible jump as a mixture of singular distributions. And all of the sudden, oops, the spike and slab prior is, you know, it can be formulated as a mixture as in, in this framework, right? So all of the sudden we realize that, okay, now it's possible to actually use the discrete spike and slab for in any setting beyond uh, Gaussian data, beyond uh, conjugate, uh, conjugate priors. The, the, the trick is maybe, you know, too technical for, for this webinar, but the trick is to, do a, a joint sample of the indicators and the coefficients so that the coefficients, which is zero, actually remain uh, in, uh, in, in, the, in, the, um, in, the, in the space, in the model. Okay. Um, and so the book also tries you know, to sort of um, shed light on, on this aspect of the um, literature on, uh, on um, Spike and Slapari, because for many years, there have been a little bit of confusion in the literature of, of indeed when you can use a discrete and when you should use a continuous uh, spike and slab. Okay, okay I'll um, move on, I'll try to move on more. Yeah, so maybe let me show you 
uh, spike and synapse in practice. Um, I have, yes, half an hour. Okay, so let's see. Maybe I can do both the neuroimaging and the microbiome application. So let me see. It, it's um, it's it's work that I have done in neuroimaging and work that I have done in microbiome, where uh, as I said, I have been using this uh, construction with biscuit spike and synapse priors for variable selection. So let's see an example from neuroimaging, in particular the analysis of uh, fMRI data. In fMRI studies, so typically we have a, a, a subject that, that lies in a, in a, in a scanner, in, in a machine like you see up here in the figure. Sometimes the subject doesn't do anything, and in that case we would measure what we call resting state data, but most of the times the subjects are asked to uh, respond to some sort of stimuli. Maybe there is a small monitor in the scanner and, and um, the subject is instructed to tap his finger when something happens on the monitor and just do nothing when there is nothing going on on the, on the monitor. Right? So those are what we call uh, task-based uh, um, experiments where the subject is actually doing an experiment, responding to stimuli while we measure his um, bold signal, which is um, um, the, the way that the, the, the blood fluctu fluctuates in, uh, in the brain. Okay? This measurements is done at, um, uh, as, as time series data. Right? So it, the measurements are done at equally spaced uh, time points. And uh, the measurements are done on the brain by essentially dividing the brain in small cubes that we call voxels. So that literally the machine will produce uh, for you know how many voxels uh, uh, we have in the brain will will produce a time series of of this type. Okay. <clears throat> so for, so with a single subject, we could have like you know at the voxel level we we could have three hundred thousand voxels so three hundred thousand time series for a given subject. Typically, what we do with these experiments, the voxels are um averaged in what we call regions okay so the brain is parcellating into say 100 or 200 250 of these regions okay so it's so a typical subject will give you time series data for say 200 250 uh, regions of uh, uh, regions of interest we call them and this is just one subject I and mean, of course there will be multiple subjects right performing a a, a same experiment. Um, what's uh, what's the goal of the experiment, particularly in task-based experiment? We want to be able to figure out what regions of the brain activate in response to a particular uh, stimulus. Yeah. The way that we model uh, the data is, well, is the fMRI data is a signal plus noise, was well, a typical way of modeling time series data where the signal is defined as um, <clears throat> a convolution <clears throat> of the design uh, matrix times some regression coefficients. This convolution happens because there is a delay in the activation uh, with respect to when the stimulus is given to the subject, right? So you see something happening on the screen, and then you tap the finger. So there is a delay, right? The, the brain needs to process that something has happened. And, and so without going into you know, much, much mm, details, this uh, X is uh, designed, is um, calculated as a convolution of the design matrix, which is the stimulus, no stimulus, stimulus, no stimulus, and where the convolution takes into account this delay of, uh, of, of the brain. And, um, and the idea here is for um, um, voxels that uh, do not uh, activate in response to the brain will have a, a no response and therefore a zero uh, regression coefficient, a zero beta okay? or a flat line. So if we look at this, uh, oh, and actually, yes, I forgot about the figure. If you look at the figure, I think this is way more clear, right? So you have your sort of time series data, you have your convolved stimulus, 
and your unknown vector of regression coefficients and for uh, for voxel uh, v and you have capital v uh, voxels and so <clears throat> the non zero regression coefficient will point to a voxel or a region of the brain that activates in response to the stimulus while the non the zero beta will correspond to voxels that do not activate the signals that doesn't uh, uh, happen. So framed like this, it is, is a problem of variable selection. And within the Bayesian approach, we can think about having a spike and slap prior on the regression, uh, on the vector of regression coefficients. So here it is. This is the spike and slab that we have seen before, beta nu for voxel nu or region nu. Um, and the prior is a spike, a spike and a slab, and a slab is the typical uh, Gaussian distribution. In this framework, though, if I look at the uh, indicator, the binary indicator for the voxels, that um, uh, independent product of Bernoulli distributions doesn't make much sense because if you think uh, about how the brain uh, operates, it um, makes a lot of sense to think of nearby uh, regions or nearby voxels activating uh, together, right? Because the brain is typically divided into different portions, different regions um, that uh, like, the, like, for example, the visual regions that uh, tend to activate together in response to a particular uh, type of stimulus. So for the, for the prior on the indicators, gamma j, it makes sense to think of a prior that allows this sort of uh, um, structure, right? This sort of dependence structure, so that voxels that are nearby will be will tend to be activated together. So we we abandon here this assumption of independent Bernoulli's, right? The independent Bernoulli's we say each voxel is independent of any other voxel, and instead we can use a prior which is a Markov Randolph field prior that essentially allows us a priori to say that uh, if um, if I look at a particular voxel, uh, the prior probability for this voxel to be activated is higher if some of his neighbors are also activated. Okay, so that's what the prior uh, captures. Um, the, the, the rest of the framework is you know, similar to, to what we have seen before. We can still use some sort of conjugacy. We are not um, in a framework where we we can marginalize the, the regression coefficients, but we have that work by Gotardo and Raftery that allows us to implement a relatively um, uh, efficient uh, MCMC. We can go one step forward because this is, this is a model for a single subject. What happens if I start thinking about multiple uh, subjects, right? With multiple subjects, I could maybe think about groups of subjects that react the same way to particular stimuli, because when they do these experiments, they are looking indeed at multiple uh, uh, groups of subjects, the healthy, healthy diseases, for example, versus um, people that suffer from Alzheimer or uh, mild cognitive diseases and so on and so forth. Um, so, in so, so so that we can think about now a much more complicated model where we have multiple uh, time series for multiple subjects and we're thinking about activations that happen within uh, the brain and similarly among um, groups of uh, of patients so and and this is you know a, a big step in the methodology but so the spike and slab prior can actually be extended to this scenario into a spike and slab non-parametric prior where the slab portion of the prior is uh, a non-parametric prior that essentially allows you to induce clustering of the voxels or the regions, but across multiple uh, subjects. So that with the same prior, we'll be able to cluster um, you see subjects according to them having uh, same activations, activations in, in the same uh, area. And then again, within a subject, we still have the uh, Marco Randolph field prior that allows us to borrow strength from nearby uh, voxels. Okay? So this is you know, how much you can stretch 
the very simple kind of, you know, Georgia McCulloch framework for spike and slab prior. This is how much you can stretch it up for an application and in a way that, you know, it makes sense to use uh, information uh, that, that, that you know about the problem, right? Information that you know about how, in this particular case, brain regions in the brain, in, regions in the brain interact with, with each other. And also it can be exploited to actually come up with a clustering of, uh, uh, of activations among multiple subjects, right? So, so it's a big step with respect to the sort of like, you know, the original formulation that I showed you, but hopefully it gives you an idea of, you know, how powerful this class of priors can be. And then just to move on to the next, just I'm skipping some stuff. Okay. Move on to another uh, application, maybe simpler than the one that we just saw. Um, but this is an application to genomics and in particular to microbiome uh, uh, data. <clears throat> so the human microbiome is a community of microorganisms or microbes, which are um, associated with the with the with the human body, and they are a collection of various things like viruses, bacteria, and so on that are present, you know, in, in for example our gut. Lately, there has been a lot of research going on in um, in genomics on microbiomes because we have realized that indeed it's very important to look at, our, at the human microbiome because it can tell us a lot about the, the health of, uh, of an individual. Okay? The microbiome contributes to some of the you know, major body functions such as good uh, food digestion and energy supply. It is linked to some diseases like uh, colorectal cancer and inflammatory bowel disease. So it's just very important to, to study uh, the microbiome. Um, there are some you know, major goals in the, in the analysis. One is to you know, understand the role of the, of the communities, right? Of the, where communities is like a group of microbes of the same type or they share the same function. So, so we want to understand what's their role uh, in our bodies, but we also want to understand how the microbiome can interact with the host, with the body, and how it can respond to external uh, um, um, stimuli, like for example, from the environment, and ultimately how it can influence uh, disease. Uh, for, for today's talk, I'm just going to focus on like you know, the major um, feature of, uh, of the data and, and just one very simple goal, which is try to link, um, to study the association, associations between microbiomes and some other covariates measured on, uh, uh, on subjects. Um, so from the point of view of, of the data, um, microbiome, the bottom line is the microbiome their composition of data. So they're collected through a high throughput uh, sequencing technology. Um, typically, this technology produces counts on what we call OTUs or taxa. I think later we'll refer to those uh, to them as taxa, which are clusters of genetically similar microbes, so, so groups of microbes that somehow share uh, some sort of, uh, of function. The counts producing from, from this high throughput uh, technology have some features, for example, the, the overdispersed. There are a lot of zeros, so those are what you call zero inflated counts. And also because of you know, the way that the measurements are done, they uh, amount to be compositional. Okay? There has been a lot of debate in the field about this particular aspect of the data. And also it depends on which technology you actually use to measure the data. But, but for today's um, talk, I will be you know, assuming that I will be treating the data as, as compositional, over dispersed and zero inflated. And then in, in the <clears throat> framework that I'm going to be looking at, together with the with an abundance, abundance uh, table, so together with the microbiome data, I'm assuming to have another matrix of covariates measured on the, <clears throat> on the same subjects. I will be using uh, gene expression uh, data from, from host uh, genes, so genes in the same, uh, collected from you know, the same place where the microbiome was collected, uh, but you can also think of you know many other things. And there are lots of studies where people look at um, uh, in, uh, food intakes, 
through <clears throat> some uh, um, uh, measurements that they uh, gather with um, surveys uh, and questionnaires. Um, and, and the idea is to you know see how how the interactions are between these two types of data, right? <clears throat> how is the microbiome affected in this particular case from by the uh, gene uh, gene expression data or by the food that uh, that we eat? So if we think of this as a regression uh, model, now we have a response variable, which is a uh, composition, right? And then we have some uh, covariates. So typically for, for uh, um, compositional data, one distribution that, uh, that we use, uh, that we can think of, is the, is, the, is the multinomial distribution. That will have some parameters, phi, um, that correspond to the um, uh, relative abundances of the different uh, uh, OTUs, or, or as I said, I would refer to those as as tax. Okay, so we measured, say, abundances. Uh, um, we measured microbiome data on uh, what is capital J tax, capital J OTUs, and the distribution that we choose for the data is this multinomial distribution with J um, categories. We are then going to assume a conjugate Dirichlet prior distribution on this parameter. This is you know, commonly uh, done. In, uh, in Bayesian statistics. And we're gonna be working with um, what we call the compound multinomial, which is actually the marginal model. So we're gonna integrate over, over, over Psi. So this is now our distribution on the count, the observed count data. We are next going to incorporate the covariates, again, in sort of a standard way to obtain a Dirichlet multinomial regression model. So we look at the uh, parameter of the Dirichlet, we take the log of it and we assume that this is a linear combination of the of the predictors. So now if we if we rewrite this model all together, we have a Dirichlet multinomial log linear regression model. So we have a regression, a, a, a linear or log linear regression model, but the response is, is multinomial. But if I look at this, if I look at this uh, uh, expression, I can see my linear predictor here, okay? So X are the covariates, and this phi, Tj, are the uh, coefficients, the regression coefficients. So in particular, phi, Pj is the coefficient that captures the effect of uh, gene, mm, gene J on, uh, uh, sorry, gene P on taxa J. Yes, gene gene p on, on taxa j and the inference on these coefficients is in some sense the goal of the of the inference right because um the, the the goal of the uh, of this exercise of the analysis because i want to be able to find the interactions between uh, covariates and uh, tax i'm gonna i want to be able to find the, the genes whose expression affects the abundance of a particular taxa. And the zero phi's okay, will determine a selection for me because if phi is zero, there is no interaction <clears throat> between that covariate and that uh, uh, taxa. So in some sense, looking at again, a multivariate multiple type of, uh, of regression model. So now in continuing setting up priors for my model, I'm thinking that here for this set of parameters, I could, I must use uh, a spike and slab prior. And so I'm going to put spike and slab priors, plural, right on, on phi pj. <clears throat> Again, at zero coefficient, we mean that there is no interaction between that particular covariate and that particular taxa. That, that this, the expression of that gene does not affect the abundance of that particular taxa. This is the straightforward spike and slab prior that we have seen in the introduction with a sort of Bernoulli distribution. But here, again, like we have done in the neuroimage example, we can think, right, if we have information, and actually there is some information that people can use on how different taxa interact with each other. There are some phylogenetic relationships between taxa that we can use. We can incorporate those this knowledge into the model by changing this prior, okay? Similarly to, to what we have <clears throat> done with the imaging data. 
Uh, okay, the posterior is relatively easy. Again, with this trick that I told you about that avoids the, the reversible uh, jump. And then the, the in, if we look at um, an example, uh, okay, in this example, it's stool data from 79 individuals um, with, uh, okay, let's go too many details on the processing, but after some processing, we end up with 80 OTUs or 80 taxa. Okay, so, so we have an N of 79 and the P, uh, so it was a J, capital J of 80. And then we have an X of 79. So we have expressions on, uh, those are actually pathways, yes, on 79 uh, biochemical uh, pathways. This will be our P. Big P. Right? So N of 79, P of capital J of 70 and 79, capital J of 80 and 79 covariates. <clears throat> this is the inference that we get. Uh, this is the plot of the PPIs that, that we have seen uh, uh, before. And again, you can see if you threshold this plot to 0.5, it will allow you to select some of the coefficients, right? And again, a selected coefficient points at a significant interaction between the corresponding covariate and the corresponding response. Okay, so the corresponding pathway and the corresponding um, taxa. Here, in particular, with the median model, we found 92 of these uh, significant uh, associations. In this particular case, because we did not integrate the betas out. Uh, actually, the feeds out, we also have the inference on the actual regression coefficients corresponding to these significant interactions. And so we can plot them. And here we plotted positive versus negatives uh, because they are meaningful to the, to the collaborators. Okay? So this is the inference will be the selection on the important interactions between um, the pathway expressions and tax abundances and the sort of direction and um, of that relationship and the strength of that relationship. Okay, I'll um, stop here so maybe we can take more questions. Let me go to the conclusion. As I said, I've had this stuff on graphical models, which I will leave in the slides just you know, for people to have those references. Let me jump to the summary and conclusions. So, so I presented you spike and priors that are used in linear settings for, for variable selection. I've told you a little bit about the history of Spike and Slab and these two um, different uh, types of like a discrete and continuous Spike and uh, Slab and, and uh, um, uh, how <clears throat> the methodology has uh, evolved. I hope through the applications, although I went very fast, I hope I have convinced you that they are very flexible structures that can incorporate a whole lot of external information, which you might or might not available, have available from, from the problem. They're very well suited for applications. They can extend beyond Gaussian cases. Again, the last application was to uh, count uh, data, compositional data, I skipped on graphical models. And um, um, there was also a question about this, about scalability. I think everything I have presented you was done with MCMC. But if you want to scale up the methods even more, there are now uh, solutions with variational uh, inference that work specific, uh, specifically for uh, spike and slab priors, and uh, um, they really allow lots of scalability. Um, I did not spend much time on improved performance of a competing approaches, but uh, uh, if you read the papers, you will see typically there is a simulation study where these priors are compared with whatever lasso penalized methods uh, is available for that problem. And um, so I'll conclude with some thanks and point, pointed to my website where I have all, all the papers, the software, you can write to me, uh, this is my email. Instead of listing all my collaborators, which are really <laughs> too many, I thought I would do this, uh, I would try this uh, word of cloud of names so that you can actually see I, I've mentioned Mahalet Tadesek. We co-edited the book together. I've done a lot of this work with her. I mentioned Phil Brown, maybe, who I did my postdoctoral work 
uh, in Kent, Car Canterbury many years ago. And then I do a lot of work with Michele Guindani at UCLA, Christine Peterson at the MD Anderson, Francesco Stingo in Florence, Sharon Chang um, in, uh, in LA. And I've um, described the work with Matteo Kozlowski on microbiome uh, data. And I think that's all I have. So we have leave some minutes for um, discussion. This is wonderful, Marina. Thank you so much. It's really, it's a very exciting topic. Uh, and uh, we have some questions in the Q&A. Maybe you, you could open your screen and, and take a look. It's probably easier. Okay, so the first one, will there be any additional online resources that can be accessed re regarding this? Uh, yes, so, okay, one resource is my website. Another resource is the book, of course, right? The, the handbook of Bayesian variable selection. The handbook also has a website with supplementary material. So for some of the chapters, there are codes, for example, that you can access uh, through the, the supplementary website of, um, uh, of the book. Um, as I said, you can also write to me and I mean, I'll be happy to point you to, to more resources. In particular, codes, uh, I think nowadays there are quite a, quite a few R packages. There are a lot of R, R packages for shrinkage priors, but there are also a few packages for spike and slab prior. There is a BAS, B-A-S, which is an R package done by, by Merlis Clyde at Duke. And there is a boom spike, I believe, that implements all sorts of spike and slab prior. So, so the a software is coming out, R packages are coming out. Com the second question, comparing a model using Spikers Lab and reversible jump for variable selection is the former probably faster to simulate posterior samples. Y yes, I mean, the yeah, because the reversible jump is, is so hard to, to implement, particularly in these settings where you have multivar multivariate uh, responses and multiple covariates, the mixing, because then you have to deal with the variance and covariance matrices and is just very difficult. The mixing is really difficult. Um, I've done that in the framework of, of clustering methods, uh, not, not so much with, uh, with linear models, but definitely if you, yeah, if you can avoid it through that joint sampling of indicators and parameters, that's definitely the, the, the way to go. And then when you say relatively efficient with MCMC and fMRI case, how much did you take to sample? How large was the data? I said, yes. Yeah. So with the fMRI, we have done uh, some implementation with the full MCMC and, and MATLAB codes. And I think we were able to scale up uh, to the, the, yes, the full parcellation of the brain, which was around 100 regions. And I don't remember how many subjects, I would say a, a, few, a few tens of subjects for sure. We have also done a variational inference implementation of that model. And there is actually a MATLAB GUI, which is wants to be a user-friendly GUI when you upload your data and then you click, 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 and it runs <laughs> the variational base for you and gives you the, the inference. So that one works very, very well. I mean, it is it is fast. So you still have to, you know, just wait a few minutes for the uh, variational inference to, to run, but I, I believe that, that that one can scale up to certainly larger parcellations of, uh, of the brain. And then STAN could be used to accelerate the MCMC convergence. Yes, STAN, um, yes, there are some implementation of STAN. The problem with STAN is that uh, you cannot implement the discrete spike and slab because STAN doesn't work with uh, discrete um, distributions. But um, there is uh, in the literature a, a, a prior called L1 ball by uh, Amy Herring and uh, Mauran Chu and uh, Leon, I believe he's in Florida. And uh, so they have an, an L1 ball, I can send this reference if you are interested, an, an L1 ball prior, which emulates a discrete spike and slab, uh, but can be implemented in STAN. So there is that development out there for STAN. Otherwise, the standard discrete spike and slab that we have presented it cannot be implemented in, in STAN, yeah. Okay, these were all the questions. 
Yeah, these were all the questions. So just as a reminder to everyone, the recording and the slides will be available from the SERS website. I have placed the link uh, on the chat. So please uh, follow our website and follow our program. Hopefully soon we will announce the second webinar of this year. And again, Marina, thank you very much. I think we we are off to a very good start. It's It's a promising year. It's the third year that we we organized this this webinar and we are all very excited and uh, again sirs and swb uh thank you for for starting the year so well thanks a lot thank, thank you. you everyone take care and hope to see you in the second edition of the 2024 webinar see you take care thank you thank you